recording starting now. So uh, this question goes back to uncertainty reduction theory, which was one of the first theories that we talked about in the class, which the following is not one of the three major ways to reduce uncertainty. Uh, a, passive. Many folks feel that passive is the best answer. Active, interactive, contextual. Yes, so the correct answer here is contextual. Right, URT, uh, thinking back to that catfish example, right, suggests that there's a variety of different ways that we proactively reduce uncertainty every day. A passive approach generally involves things such as observational learning. So, for instance, if you, you know, see uh, somebody else who's eating a meal and they get sick, maybe you're going to avoid that food. That dates back uh, many generations to how we in the past would try to survive. An active approach means that we're trying to gather um, more information in an agentic way. So maybe we are Facebook stalking a friend or somebody that we're dating in order to learn more about them and figure out who they are and if they're a good fit for us. And then interactive means an interaction or involvement between you and the other person. So an interactive approach might involve you directly talking, conversing, and learning more about the other person. So, I wanted to take us back a little bit more for this question in order to help to prepare you. I also want to talk about a few of the things that I provided for you shortly after class ended. Uh, so there are three major things that I'd like you to have on your radar that are available for you that you can use in the coming months. So if you go to the front page of Canvas, um, you'll notice also through an announcement that there was some um, new resources available. So the first thing that I want to direct you to is to the midterm study guide. Again, I like to post those two weeks or more from when you take the exam. So I posted that on Wednesday in order to help you to prepare for the exam. The way that I've structured the midterm study guide right, is to go over all of the major concepts, as well as the readings that you are responsible for knowing as uh, you prepare for that exam, right? So you'll see that these terms are all listed here, and they're listed in order of when they showed up in the readings. So we start with really basic stuff like interpersonal communication, as was hierarchy of needs, perception, and so on, right? Um, the most recent stuff that we've been over has been cultural intelligence. That was Wednesday's class where we talked about these four forms of cultural intelligence. We used this example, right, with Brennan, who is going into a new culture and trying to adjust. And we talked about how these different cultural intelligence styles could be incorporated. Next week, we'll be getting into concentration uh, on uh, conversations as well as listening styles, right? So that will help us to understand some of these last terms and concepts. And then um, the readings, right, are the ones that I'm asking you to know going into the exam. The best way to do this is to make sure, first of all, have you read through all the readings that I'm asking you to complete. One way that you can approach the readings is to basically go through each one and see uh, in a few sentences how you could describe it. So in other words, uh, the Internet Friends article discusses the ways that our interpersonal communication has changed surrounding COVID-19, particularly the way that we form relationships with others online. It suggests that while we form some short-term relationships, when things have reopened, we've transitioned away from those relationships and more face-to-face. -face. So something like that, where you in a few sentences describe the key ideas from the readings, can be helpful for you as you go back to the uh, information later. Um, piece I asked you to read for today, right, is about Nasarima, and then uh, talking and listening are going to be the Monday and Wednesday readings uh, that are just the last pieces of new content to know going into the exam. But one way that you can approach this is to use uh, these questions or use these terms and concepts as a cheat sheet, right? So, for instance, um, looking through these terms or concepts, um, you can think to yourself, can I give a definition? in my own words, one, and two, can I provide an example or application that uses this term in action, right? So for instance, um, you might look at denotative meaning, right? Denotative being the dictionary definition of a word. And you might say, for instance, uh, the word leaves can be used to refer to 
uh, parts of a tree, right? Uh, or it can also be used to refer to exiting an area. So knowing the term, knowing your own definition is helpful. You can even modify the study guide if you want to, like a Google Doc or Word document, to add in your own definition there uh, and use that as you're working through these ideas. So you might kind of cross compare uh, the terms and concepts from the study guide to your own notes and see if you've got a good grasp of that. So that's the first thing that's available to you. The second thing that I have available are practice midterm questions. So I know that we do these every day, uh, but I also wanted to provide you some additional ones that can help you. Uh, you can do these questions as many times as you'd like, and I've added some comments about uh, sort of why uh, one answer might be the best answer to that question. Another thing that I want to direct you to is at the bottom here, we have two short essay style questions, right? So the short essay style questions are designed so that um, you have a sense of what to expect from the short essay questions. Um, you can also um, email me if you would like feedback on your short essay responses and want to know what grade you would expect to receive on those. Again, I uh, derive um, sometimes exact questions from the study guide onto the actual exam. So looking through um, the study guide and this information uh, is a really helpful way to get you to prepare. Um, so let me know if you would like feedback on that. Generally speaking, each part of the prompt, anywhere between three to five sentences, for instance, on A, on B, or on C, is generally enough to answer uh, the parts of the question. One thing that I do allow is that if you would like uh, to answer all four questions, uh, so I give you four uh, prompts available, you'll choose three. If you want to answer all four, I'll grade your best three. Or if you'd rather focus on really crystallizing uh, three really good answers, you can do that too. One thing you can always do once you get extra time on the exam is to go in and add more details and information that can only help you um, to uh, supplement these questions a bit more. So again, this is a sense of what to expect on the exam. Um, and you can use these practice questions to help you to prepare. Another thing that I want to direct you to, uh, the last item, is early feedback form. Uh, I know two of you have had the chance to complete this, but if you haven't already, uh, please do this by the end of the day today. Uh, so again, while we do evaluations at the end of the quarter that kind of give me a sense of how the course went for you, that's not directly helpful to you. Um, by you completing uh, this feedback form, that allows me to get information about what's working well, what I can do to adjust the course, and so on to better to support you in the class. One thing that was brought up in my other class, for instance, is that having something like a clearer timeline for how you might go about preparing for and completing uh, the interpersonal analysis essay could be really useful. So um, that's one thing that I'm incorporating for today. But again, it's helpful for me to get a sense of what works uh, and what I can do to change or modify the class. Um, I'm not a fan, like if there's something you don't like, or that's not working in the class, of continuing to do that thing for the whole quarter. I like to know and I like to course correct. So um, feel free to complete that by the end of the day today and that'll be uh, useful for both of us. So again, that information, including the midterm, practice midterm questions, um, and that form are available here on the front page of Canvas and through the most recent Canvas announcement. The other thing to direct yourself toward is the discussion leading schedule. Again, um, we are transitioning into our first discussion leading group on October 25th, so next Monday. Um, and so we'll be working right through that. One thing that I'm asking you to do is to turn in your outline by the time you are scheduled to present. Right? The outline is the two to three page overview of the key concepts and ideas and things that you'll be covering in the discussion leading. If you want to send me slides in advance, like email them to me uh, or even send me something like a video, I'm happy to pull that up for you. Just please get that to me before the class starts so that I can pull that up for you. The way that I'll do it is I'll just uh, start the class by turning it over to you, give you the 15 to 20 minutes that you'd like for discussion leading, and then I'll pick up on the concepts and ideas from there. You don't have to cover everything in the chapter. Um, you can just cover the major ideas, and I'll help to fill in and provide uh, more information and examples that can use these ideas. So um, that's the discussion leading coming up. Does anybody have any questions about anything that I talked about or anything related to the class in general? How many problems are on the midterm? So there's 25 multiple choice questions, uh, and then uh, 
a total of four short essay questions. You'll pick three of them. You can do all four, and I'll grade your top three. Yeah? Is it paper test or? No. So the midterm is taken on Canvas. So um, between November 3rd and November 5th, the 72 hour window, right? Um, you can choose to take the exam wherever you want. It's not proctored. You don't have to do um, it on campus if you don't want to. You can take it anywhere, right? Uh, once you choose to take it, you have two hours to complete it. So the way that um, the schedule kind of works out is that next week we'll be getting into new material. And then uh, on November 1st, we'll do a midterm review. We won't be meeting in class on the 3rd and 5th of November, that Wednesday and Friday, so that you can use that time to help to take the exam. Good question. Remember, there are no bad questions. So uh, at any point, if you'd like to interrupt or a question comes up, please let me know, and I'm happy to help you. So the major area we focused on in last class was the idea of being an effective intercultural communicator, and in particular, this focus on cultural intelligence. We looked at a TED Talk that was uh, advancing this idea of the talk of the flying dead, right, which is like the fifth or sixth Walking Dead spinoff, but it's actually a way of understanding how, even though we are engaged in other cultures um, in terms of travel, we don't necessarily learn about uh, or get to know the needs of other cultures. Because we're a lot more globalized and connected, if we speak English and we're traveling to an entirely different country, there's going to be a significant portion of the population that does speak English or is similar to us and really prevents us from actually really learning a whole lot else. So we applied uh, skills of cultural intelligence, not only being motivated, but also through cognition, right, metacognition, or thinking about thinking, that help people like uh, Brendan to better engage with other cultures. Talked a little bit about the exam as well. Right, cultural intelligence gets at this idea of how effective you are at engaging in issues related to diversity in cultures. Um, this is not only super relevant and important to us when we think about um, how we interact with cultures every day, but it's also a skill a lot of employers are looking for. Um, we're not only connecting with other cultures in terms of nationality, right, or countries that we hail from, but also in a lot of other elements. So for instance, even within a country, there are a significant number of cultural differences, right? The experience of um, being uh, an indigenous uh, member of the community and its relationship to um, the broader culture of the United States, right, is a really huge element. Uh, the way that, for instance, um, community might differ depending on the state or even the city, having these smaller sub or micro cultures and understanding the unique dynamics of those locations is a really big deal. Even within the state of Oregon, right, the major differences in some of the more rural or urban parts of the state are a really big area, too. There's a lot of divides and, at times, right, stereotypes of uh, different parts of the state and very different cultural experiences that people within the state uh, can exhibit. So understanding the unique needs and concerns of different cultures is super relevant. Talked about these four different factors. Again, having a good grasp of these is a good thing to know as you prepare for the exam. So we talked a little bit about preparation for the midterm exam today. And then I want to dedicate most of the class to talking about the Nasarima article, because this is a kind of fun and interesting way for us to apply and look at uh, elements of cultural intelligence and these ideas of culture in general that we've been talking about for this week. One other thing that I want to direct you to is um, ways that you might prepare for notes on readings. So I mentioned this earlier, but uh, one way that you can do this is kind of framing uh, each of your readings that you've completed for this class with a brief synopsis or annotation. How many of you have ever completed an annotated bibliography for a class? How many of you have heard of an annotated bibliography? Yeah, so a couple of you. An annotated bibliography, right, is when you take a citation from an article or other source and then you use a kind of brief paragraph or a few sentences that provide a synopsis or description of that reading. 
it's a really useful skill and thing to do in just about any class, uh, especially as you're working through uh, multiple readings or assignments, right? Um, if you have it kind of as a notebook or maybe you're typing it up um, and putting it together, it makes it so easy for you to go back to previous readings and say, oh yeah, this was the mean idea here, this was the thing I need here, and as you prepare for things like essays, it helps you get um, ideas to pull from, right? So I definitely recommend, as a style of taking notes, using uh, the uh, annotations or a brief few sentences that summarize the reading, because if you're just looking through like your in-text notes or your highlights, you might miss the main ideas. So this is a great way to help you on that. Another thing that, um, again, a couple people in my other class mentioned that could be useful is thinking about a timeline for completing the interpersonal analysis essay. Again, both the description and rubric for that assignment are available. One way that you can do this, and again, I don't need anything except for the final draft on November 19th, so you're welcome to send the drafts, is to think about how you pace and work backwards from a major assignment. Right, so I'm a really big fan of working backwards, uh, looking at a due date for an assignment, and then thinking, well, how am I going to get there? What do I need to do um, each week to get there? Right? We talked a little bit uh, a few weeks ago about how to avoid some of the issues of procrastination and brainstorming. So one model that you can think about is a week from today, uh, next Friday, maybe you can set a timeline for yourself to figure out a topic and possible uh, sources, such as the textbook that you would use, uh, to back up this point. So since we're getting into the last new material before the midterm next week, we're getting into the role of talking and listening. So maybe um, you're really interested in a TV show in which the two characters do not seem like they're listening to each other very well. Um, they're not doing a good job of describing each other's experiences. Maybe you can draw from the talking and listening portion of the class and use that as your main source. Um, but you can use this time to start thinking about are there shows, are there movies, or other pieces of media that you find yourself really interested in and want to look at a relationship between two people or characters? Um, are there key ideas from the class that you found really interesting? If you're really invested in the issue of culture, you want to understand how people within different cultures are communicating. So you might use some time now and next week to start to brainstorm and put together a possible topic. Again, I'm happy to look at your topic ideas. We'll do a couple activities in class next week to help you with brainstorming as well. One thing that you could do the following week then is to develop kind of an initial outline and thesis sentence. What is the main argument or idea that you're hoping to advance in the session? The following week, you could have a much longer outline that integrates more supporting details, references from uh, your reading, and so on, that you know will help to put together uh, the essay in total. Then the following week, right, um, as you're leading up to the last couple days, uh, I really like the finish it, put it down method, right, where you complete your final draft at least 24 to 48 hours in advance, put it out of sight, out of mind, either you physically print it or you have it available to access online, you look back through it, and then you use that to um, note any remaining revisions or issues that you need to fix. Uh, getting that in a couple days in advance will also help you just to make sure that you have it in on time, especially if there's tech issues or other things that might come up. One thing to remember is that all the major assignments in the class, the written ones, uh, as well as your makeup assignments, are ones that I'm asking you to submit through Canvas. So please do not send me like a Google Drive uh, because that can be edited, deleted, changed, and so on, right? Getting me a stable document to use to complete these assignments is really important. So um, that's just kind of a timeline to help you in ways to prepare and think ahead. Again, you don't have to follow this timeline, but it's a good way for you to start to develop your ideas. So what I'd like us to do is if you've done the reading for today and you feel pretty good about it, you can work on this alone. Um, if you did not uh, complete the reading for today or you'd like some additional help or feedback, uh, you're welcome to work in a small group with other people. What I'd like you to look at is using today's reading on body ritual of the Nasarima, um, kind of address these three major questions. First of all, who are the Nasarima as a culture, according to this article? How does Minor, um, the author of this reading, portray the Nasarima, 
And then lastly, how might one practice cultural intelligence toward the next week? So again, if you did the reading, you feel good, you can work on this alone. But if you'd like some additional support, you might find a small group of people. What I'd like each, uh, either alone or in your group, make sure to uh, have your name written or typed. Uh, and I will ask you to turn this in for attendance later. So work through these questions, and then we'll talk about these together in just a little bit. I originally read this article when I was kind of learning about like social studies and history, and I, I like wrote this really long thing where I was like, yes, Rima are so strange. Holy Malchun, what the heck is going on? Like, this culture seems really bizarre, right? And so then I heard, oh, it's American backwards, and I was like, huh, why did I see this as so strange when it's a lot of what we do, right? So if you didn't catch up on uh, it being American backwards, right? Uh, I didn't either, and I totally, um, it's, it's such a different way to describe, like, human behavior in the United States, right? So um, I didn't want to share this to trick you. I wanted to share it because I feel like it offers some more insight into cultures and the way that we use communication to describe and think about different cultures, right? So uh, Body Ritual of the Nasarima was published in 1956 in the journal uh, American Anthropologist. So um, basically, in the 1950s, um, and sort of the broader trend within a lot of social sciences, including anthropology, communication, and so on, right, is this idea that we were fascinated with um, cultures or identities outside of our own. So one common way of writing and describing other cultures typically involved, like, uh, a white American or British, uh, British scholar who goes into another country and describes, like, the behavior, the actions of, you know, an indigenous group or a, a country that's lesser known or less popular, right, and just writes on how, how bizarre or strange this culture's behavior and rituals would be, right? And a lot of the way that um, those articles played out was very much this kind of ethnocentric perspective that these cultures are strange and savage and bizarre, but here in the United States, right, things are um, much more normal, they make sense. Um, and so that was a really common trend at the time, was that the writing that was published was this very ethnocentric, um, US-centric perspective on these weird outside groups. And so Minor, 1956, kind of does this parody um, and sort of critique of that, right, where he says, well, what if we use the way that we're describing other cultures and tribes and turn that on its head, right? What if an outsider portrays American culture and uses different language to describe American culture that's similar to how, at the time, we were talking about other cultures, right? So, um, again, a lot of the terminology that's being used here, uh, mouth men being dentists, shrines being facilities such as bathrooms, uh, the way that things such as schools are talking, talked about, this idea of like baking your head or using something like a hairdryer, right? It all sounds really weird when it's portrayed in a different way. And in many ways, Minor was saying, well, if you're another culture, um, right, this might seem strange to you. If we reframe it in a different way, the things that we interpret as normal, taken for granted, given part of our society or culture, um, if they're reframed or looked at from an outside perspective, definitely seem really odd or weird, right? And at the same time, if we're using this very like fascinated, look at these strange specimens over here, ways to describe other cultures, we're not really practicing cultural intelligence. We're not really learning about them. So maybe we should rethink the way that we describe and think about members of other cultures and other groups, right? So it's in many ways a way that we critique the role of ethnocentrism in society and the way that it impacts our communication. So, one of the key ideas that can emerge here, right, a lot of the so what and why this article would be important for this class is how do we talk about other cultures? So if you have the chance to meet a student who comes from a really different cultural background as you do, um, you know, are you uh, making this sort of judgment about, huh, this seems really strange, why do they do this? Okay. 
uh, or are you taking the time to understand the kind of history uh, behind a culture's set of behaviors and actions? Why, for instance, in the United States might we deeply value something like uh, baking your head, or this type of appearance uh, focus? Well, because a lot of the ways that advertisements, media, and so on uh, portray or view these issues is really important. What would happen if something like the United States is talked about in the same way? Well, a lot of it is portrayed as really strange, as something we wouldn't necessarily pick up on right away, and also as something that uh, maybe just seems confusing to us, right? So that's one way to kind of take away some things from there. And so when you're thinking about where this article situates in the overall class and its importance for interpersonal communication, right? Reframing our own culture is a way for us to understand how we engage with other people, right? How we learn from other people. Um, it also means that we can use things like uh, cultural intelligence practices, like empathy, motivation, to better understand other cultures. That is, um, if we, uh, as was brought up earlier, engage in cognition and try to understand uh, members of another culture, and not just what they do, but why they do it, uh, that's a big step. We can also um, try to use things such as action and behavior, where we're adjusting our approach to think about the needs of members of other groups. One thing that many people in the United States don't think about is how members of other cultures might be actively adjusting and changing their own behavior to try to accommodate uh, an incredibly different situation, right? So, um, for instance, practices surrounding how actively you speak or interrupt or participate, a focus on things like competitive or individual achievement, like those are all things that, uh, for those that, uh, who don't see that as a major part of their culture, might have to adjust to or think about. So Nasserim is a way to challenge our ethnocentrism um, and our belief that our culture is best by portraying our culture in a way that's unusual or odd. So this is an article that helps us to better understand the ideas we talked about on Monday and Wednesday, right? Not only in terms of defining what a culture is, in terms of its practices, behaviors, and so on, uh, as well as how we can engage in things like cultural intelligence to better understand the needs of different cultures, and then, therefore, how we can communicate among members of different cultures and groups. So when you're thinking about where this reading overall situates in the class and the ideas, um, its significance to culture and how we talk about culture is a really big way to do that. So that kind of goes over the main things I wanted to cover for today. For next class, uh, please read 218 to 228. We also have discussion leading next class, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, we'll be addressing talking. So how do we talk? And how does our talking uh, reflect interpersonal communication and some of the broader ideas we've been talking about in the class? So please email me or pass forward uh, your attendance work for today. I hope you have an excellent weekend and survive uh, this rainy, dreary fall organ day. And I will see you all again on Monday.